Good afternoon and thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. With the calendar closing in on July, there's plenty to do in our gardens and home landscapes. So today we're calling on our experts at the University of Vermont to give us some tips and what problems to watch out for. It's always a pleasure to welcome UVM horticulturalist Leonard Perry and Ann Hazelrig, who heads the university's plant diagnostic clinic. Great to have you both with yes. us. And of course, talk about the <laughs> great out of doors. It's um, summer, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Least, yeah, on the calendar. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, on the calendar. <laughs> you never know day to day, but it's summer. But <laughs> so Leonard, uh, you are gonna talk to us about some new perennials. Yeah, I always there. like to bring some flower pictures. So, awesome. and then there is the back Baptisia, which I think is one of my favorites, the false indigo. Uh -huh. It's a hardy perennial. It's long lived. I mean, we're talking decades if you just leave it there. Here's a picture. It's upright. It makes it kind of like an instant shrub. This will die back to the ground, so uh -huh. it is a perennial. But that's what it looks like this time of year. I mean, it's about that four to five time. feet high oh, wow. and maybe four to five feet across after those flowers. Later in the summer, you get these uh, bean pods that have seeds in, and they're hard and they rattle. Kids use them, you know, to, <laughs> for little, you know, things to make noise. Um, and false indigo, it was used by native peoples as an indigo dye substitute, mm. a poor one, but um, it was. And you can see those nice compound leaves. But there are many new colors that, that indigo kind of dark purpley color was the kind of the original but then here's a variation called purple smoke um, that's out and uh, recently there's been a lot of breeding in recent years uh, white there's a white species alba mm. but then there's some cultivars cultivated varieties this is Wayne's world and again you can see that <laughs> vase shape upright and you know maybe again four to five feet high and mm. five to six feet across and um, Th there's this one, there's some yellows out there. Uh, Carolina mm -hmm. Moonlight, it's one of my favorites. Very kind of a light yellow. I've had this one growing in my garden for years. And as well as this one, this is called Screaming Yellow. <laughs> um, and if you want a real bright yellow, this is one of those they call a 55 mile an hour plane. If you're going down the road fast, you'll notice this one. Um, but this, this is a, just another color. Um, and then there's some newer ones that are kind of variations on reddish uh, and, and reddish purples, uh, like this one here, the Prairie Blues, which is a series which is spread out in Chicago at the Botanic Garden, <coughs> Twilight Prairie Blues. Um, so the Chicago Land Grows Introduction Program, you'll see some of those. Uh, the Proven Winners has a whole line, the Decadent Series. So there's just quite a few. Um, and in fact, there's been a trial uh, down in Mount Cuba. It's a great garden. It's down in Delaware, if you're ever down in Wilmington area. And they've done a trial for some years of Baptisias, the false indigos. And there you can see just some of the different mm. many colors of this uh, great plant. The deer don't like it. It mm. is somewhat slower growing and doesn't like to be moved. It has big deep tap root, which makes it great for drought conditions, but also means put it where you want it and leave it. It really doesn't like to be dug and moved all the time. Right, is it, is it full sun? A uh, full sun plant, yeah, it's really could, what could it likes. Could you do it on the edge of a, of a forest or probably not? You could, not, yeah, yeah. So it, it wouldn't bloom as much yeah. if it got part, part sun, but full sun's really the best for it. Okay, great, Leonard. I have all these little seedlings from mine. They yeah. must yeah. kind of creep along a little bit. Well, sometimes, yeah, they can see. They don't yeah. really creep, but the, the seed, it makes a bigger and bigger clump, but, yeah. but the seed can seed. Sometimes mine haven't. But. Yeah. yeah. They're beautiful. Okay, Ann, so what's cropping up <laughs> and crawling around and creating problems? Yes, well, uh, uh, I'm, I brought pictures of things that have all come into the plant diagnostic clinic in the last couple of weeks. So mm. these are things that gardeners have sent in to me saying, what is this? So right. this first one, it's really kind of a cool pest um, and it's not that big of a deal. And uh, if you're really interested, the New York Times ha just had a great article about this little guy and it's called mm. a spittle bug. And it looks <laughs> like um, somebody has spit on your plant kind of. And if you look into those bubbles, you'll find a little insect. It's a nymph of a, uh, it's called a frog hopper. And what this little nymph does, it's a juvenile of the frog hopper. And it generates all this, uh, these bubbles of foam from its urine, really watery urine. And then it emits oxygen from its abdomen to create this bubble and this foam. So. It, you know, it protects wow. him while he wow. feeds, uh -huh. and he's got a piercing sucking mouth part, or she has a piercing <laughs> sucking mouth part, and they're sucking plant juices uh, in the protection of all this foam. Wow. 
So right. it's kind of cool. And I guess they stick their rear end outside of the foam so they can still breathe. But if you disturb it, it will go into that foam and hide and then breathe by breaking the bubbles. Creatures, but does it I hurt know. the plants? Well, it does <laughs> suck plant sap, suck. but you know, it's not that big of, of a deal. So yeah. I would never, you could spray an insecticide, but it's just not worth it. I saw it on, this was on a fava bean that somebody sent huh. in. I've got it on my bachelor buttons. It'll just get on just about everything, but it's right. kind of a cool thing to see. Right, so you can see it, but you can brush it off too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. This next one, well, this was from my garden, but I've gotten other questions from commercial growers. Uh, this uh, is on my Shasta daisy, and it actually, to me, when I first look at it, it looks like a fungal leaf spot. It's mm -hmm. little circular spots that are sort of sunken. Um, this little pest attacks Shasta daisies, mints, basil, <laughs> peppers. Mm causes these little leaf spots, and both the adult and the nymph make these circular little holes on the foliage. And again, it's not that big of a pest problem, but it, it doesn't look good. So, right. um, but they're here all throughout the summer, kind of, so it's hard, you wouldn't really want to spray an herb anyway with an insecticide. Right. So, uh, but you could, you know, use a jet of water, insecticidal soap, but it's just sort of an interesting Right, so, so pest. it's 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 mainly cosmetic, but it you is could mainly. get them off with but an insecticidal soap. Yeah, or it's called a four-lined no. plant bug, and the nymph is kind of reddish, and then the adult uh, has four black lines and sort of a greenish color in between. And you don't see it that much because okay. they kind of fly away or they drop okay. if you come near. But if you see those little circular spots, mm -hmm. especially on basil, that's probably what it is. You could use okay. a row cover if you uh -huh. wanted. That might yeah. exclude them on basil or something like that. Okay. This is another Ooh. one. We've gotten a lot of calls on this. This is called peach leaf curl, and it's a fungus disease. It's really kind of pretty and striking. It causes <laughs> this, uh, these deformed leaves only on peaches um, and kind of pinkish, purplish. And by the time you see the disease, it's really too late. But this mm. uh, pathogen likes cool, wet springs, which we've certainly had. Yes. So uh, it won't kill the tree, it just looks kind of bad, but the time to control it is next year, late winter, early spring, you can spray a fungicide and uh, try to protect the tree next okay. spring. Because it, it does come back year after year. It will, friend. but you know, if we have a warm, dry spring, which when's the last time we had a warm, dry spring? <laughs> um, yeah, it won't be as big of a problem. Right. So one other, uh, problem that I've heard a lot of growers uh, complain about right now and the, with the recent rains and all of our peonies are starting to bloom, right. there's a really common disease, a fungus disease called gray mold or botrytis. And what happens mm. is the, the bloom comes up, the bud is, comes up, we get a big heavy rain and all of a sudden the, uh, the bud turns brown and dies and then mm. you see all these little gray spores on it. So the best thing to do for this is just clip that diseased portion out, destroy it, and hopefully the next blooms, you know, we don't have as much rain and they come out just fine. Okay, great. Thanks, Anne. And uh, Leonard, you have something to talk to us about, something unusual that's sprouting up. Yeah, this is seeing. another problem that people have. It's called okay. liverwort. Uh, huh. You see a, a lot more. Um, here's a close-up as well as how it just grows here, just actually on weed fabric and you can just scrape it off, mm. but it grows in the soil too. It's not really a plant, well, it's a plant, but it's not a vascular plant. It doesn't have conducting tissue in it. Uh, like most of our plants, it's more like a moss or a fern. It, it produces spores. Actually, it predates those. It goes back 400 million years to the <laughs> Devonian era. Uh, I mean, so it is an ancient <laughs> plant. So, uh, but it's come a problem more because it's, it loves moist mm. conditions. It, and we buy nursery plants. It comes in in nursery pots and gets established. I've got it everywhere. Not being a real plant, it's hard to control. We well, can't really control it with herbicides, but there are uh, products out there that are heavy salts that just basically burn it okay. back. You can get, look for a product that says for liverwort control, and then um, they're just basically, yeah. it's kind of like an organic thing, but it's just, right. you spray that on it, so, or scrape it off. So, um, a little more quickly now, uh, time, time for 
bringing things that are outside inside. This is such a great year for bringing in bouquets. My cat reminded me of this Any other day. I brought there. in some ferns <laughs> to put in a vase, and he thought those would be good to chew on. Uh -huh. So ferns, I'd looked, you know, and made sure, and, and ferns aren't toxic. But there are some plants that are toxic, and I brought a list of just a few here. Peonies, they're coming out now. Lilies of the valley, muxhood, and lilies in particular for for cats, and not mm -hmm. only our Easter lily, but uh, you know the garden lilies too and they're just a lot more and what you can do is uh, go to the ASPCA website um, and look under the pet care part and they have lists of toxic plants for dogs or cats or both. Um, they can be some variation so make sure you check that and just a good idea before you bring any of these flowers or foliage in just check the site to make if you've got a cat or a dog make sure that, that, that likes on the things. nibbles yeah. and it's not going to cause problems. Right. It could be very toxic or it might just cause upset stomach but it's right. good to know. Yeah absolutely <laughs> and and um, what else have you brought to share? Oh okay. just another uh, uh, disease problem that I've gotten a lot of calls about from foresters from landowners and it's called anthracnose and it's another cool wet season kind of disease by the time you see it it's too late to do anything about it but it gets on oaks ash and maple mm. and the uh, disease causes this browning especially along the leaf veins if it's really severe it can cause defoliation but I imagine <coughs> if you're seeing some leaf problems on maple ash or s sycamore or oak that's probably what it is I have another picture of what it looks like on maple so mm. often the fungus follows those leaf veins because it stays wetter there yeah but uh, that's been a a oh, recent oh, problem. Oh, problem. Yeah. Um, well, we're all out of time. So, Leonard, quickly, your um, your trip to Montreal yeah, Botanic we still Gardens. Have seats, uh, September? September 16th, up to the Botanic Gardens for the day and see the Chinese lanterns. You can go to my website, perrysperennials.info, look under the garden tours, and there's all the details and registration. Okay. And, Anne, if viewers want more information about outdoor gardening, they can go to your Master yeah, Gardeners. Yeah, Master site. Gardeners are a great resource. So, give us a call. Okay, and there's the information right there on your screen. Thank you, Leonard Perry and Ann Hazelrug for coming in and helping us <laughs> see what's going on in the garden. And uh, thank you all for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard.